Moved by Councillor Dreger and seconded by Councillor Buds. All those in favour? And that's carried. We have one delegation this evening. Mr. Michael uh, Kowalson is here from the Manitoba Stars Foundation and I'll ask you to take the podium. the beginning part of the presentation and I'll uh, I'll finish off. So. Thank you. Uh, good evening. It's a privilege to be here to, uh, to speak with uh, you tonight. I uh, just wanted to bring you uh, an update on what's happening with the STARS program uh, in Manitoba but also in your community here in Portage. Uh, so I uh, just wanted to talk to you about um, the STARS program. STARS stands for Shock Trauma Air Rescue Service. Um, it's a helicopter emergency medical service system that's uh, a non-profit charitable organization that we've been uh, um, in existence since 1985 and we've flown over 39,000 missions across three provinces <coughs> since then. Uh, we have six bases, two, uh, three in Alberta, two in Saskatchewan and one here in Manitoba and we do on average two missions a day here in uh, Manitoba. STARS was born out of necessity. Too many people living in rural areas were taking too long to get to trauma centers and that was recognized as a challenge and so STARS was uh, formed out of that necessity. Um, when our first helicopter took flight in 1985 we radically changed the way critical care was delivered. Uh, we built um, a community of allies uh, in our fight to better deliver care for the people uh, who really needed us. Today we continue to fight for that life as innovators, as boundary pushers, and as world leaders in emergency medical care. The reason for being is this photo here of one of our uh, very important patients. We call them VIPs. These are the folks that we uh, transport. Our patients are the reasons we fly and the reasons we wake up every day to find the most innovative ways to uh, transport and to succeed and to save lives. Half of all Western Canadians live in rural areas where emergency ground transportation isn't always fast enough. Thousands of people rely on STARS for the advanced care and direct transport to hospital that we offer. <clears throat> on board our helicopter, there's a team of flight paramedics, flight nurses, flight physicians, and behind the scenes we have engineers and we have pilots who keep our aircraft in the air all working towards one cause and one goal and that's the patient. A little bit about our, about our history and as I said earlier we started in 1985 and it was uh, members of the Lions Club that came together with some of our physicians who, ident who had, had identified the problem with getting patients to trauma centers and so the first STARS helicopter was actually known as the Lions Club Air Ambulance and it was very grassroots back then we did and that was the start of our foundation we were all volunteer and uh, and STARS grew and the demand grew and in 1991 we opened a base in Edmonton and then we opened one in Grand Prairie and then in 2011 we finally came to uh, <clears throat> the other provinces in Manitoba and in uh, Winnipeg and then Regina and Saskatoon. So as you can see by the map there, um, we are covering uh, out of those major cities across six bases across three provinces. Um, the base in Winnipeg sort of covers that area you see uh, in the circle. So um, basically south of the 53rd is where STARS respond. So from Swan River south, encompassing the three southern borders is our core area. In 2012, uh, we signed a 10-year service agreement with the government of Manitoba to provide a permanent base here in Manitoba. Uh, this past year, we flew our busiest uh, year ever, 720 missions in the fiscal year. And that's uh, added to a total of over 2,600 missions we've done here in Manitoba. 
these are the list of communities we went to this past fiscal year. It's published on our website, and um, you can see that Portage of Prairie is one of our highest uh, frequented uh, communities. Um, it takes, on average, about 21 minutes to get the helicopter into your community from our base located at the International Airport in Winnipeg. These images uh, show just some of the uh, some of the scenes that we've attended here in Portage La Prairie. Uh, the top left there is off of Trans Canada. Uh, I'm sure you all recognize the uh, the hospital. That's uh, one of the visits we were making before there was uh, um, progress towards the build of a helipad, and then other um, other photos display our interactions with your local paramedics. In 2016, the HSC helipad opened. And that uh, was really a game changer, and especially for the uh, time savings that we offer this community here. 80% of our transports go to the uh, Health Sciences campus, and um, it's uh, really benefited in terms of uh, transport time. Some of the innovations that we're able to do through um, the work that our foundation and our fundraising efforts do uh, that keeps us cutting edge is this blood on board program is one of the examples. We're actually carrying two units of uh, of blood on board the helicopter with the first and only uh, vehicle of its kind in, in Manitoba that's doing that. So we're able to do blood transfusions on the side of the highway for people who need um, urgent uh, blood. One of the uh, other initiatives is uh, the use of our night vision technology. Uh, we've been doing this for about 15 years now. We were the first civilian aviation agency to do that. That allows us to fly safely at night and we can have our mission profiles day or night because of the use of this technology. An example of what the night vision goggles do for our pilots uh, is featured on the next slide where you can see we're approaching a community. The image to the left is without that technology. The image to the right shows you how much uh, more it's an enhanced. So that allows us to provide that good service. Um, the last of the innovations I want to share with you today is um, very new. In January, we, became doing, we began doing um, ultrasound. We trained our nurses and paramedics to do what physicians would typically do, and that's an ultrasound. And uh, we're able to do that uh, in the back of the helicopter, identify any emergencies, and, and be able to govern our care based on, on that. So these are just some of the examples of the uh, innovation that uh, STARS is doing these days. And I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, this next program is, uh, you might have seen our bus uh, in your community. This is a mobile education program. This is a high fidelity uh, human patient simulator that's on board this bus and it comes to your community and it trains doctors, nurses, paramedics uh, and that's part of our human patient simulator program. Uh, we have to date trained over 2,700 medical professionals in this province. Um, and we, we visit on average about 40 communities a year. We will be in Portage de Prairie on uh, Thursday, again for another uh, wonderful visit with your staff here at the hospital, <clears throat> and again in May. This program is offered at no cost. Um, at this point, uh, we're just going to go to our second part of the presentation, and I'll uh, hand it over to Michael here to speak about our allies. So thank you for your time. So um, our funding model is unique um, across Western Canada. STARS is funded by a mix of uh, government funding uh, and um, support of government keeps us in the air. However, uh, the innovation and the uh, uh, stability of the program is funded by individual donors, uh, corporate business community, volunteers, um, and municipal uh, support from municipal governments across Canada. When you support STARS, you're riding along with us on every mission. Uh, you put the most advanced tools in our hand. And it, uh, the support from our communities helps fund the type of innovation that we're able to, uh, able to carry out. We have two main or major fundraising events in Manitoba. Uh, some of you might have heard of our rescue on the island where we take uh, a group of um, uh, eight or nine uh, prominent citizens from across the province and we take them to an island up in the White Shell and uh, Mayor Ferris, some of your colleagues uh, have been on that uh, on that and uh, we bring them back when they've raised fifty thousand dollars or the end of the day um, and uh, usually their communities rally behind that and it's a fun event um, and they get to see some of the stuff that goes on every day that our crew uh, deals with. The second, and we wanted to, one of the reasons we wanted to come tonight was to bring you uh, up to speed on, on this. May 16th and 17th is our first annual uh, STARS Critical Care on the Air Radiothon, and we are uh, 
growing this event and introducing this event in the communities of uh, Porters of Prairie, um, Morden Winkler and Steinbach. All three areas are, are high volume uh, 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 flight locations for us and uh, so we thought that this was a, we have very good community awareness here and so we thought that uh, this was a good start for us here in Manitoba. Um, every dollar raised in Manitoba stays in Manitoba to support the Manitoba pro program. Well, we do have a, a service agreement with Winnipeg Regional Health Authority uh, that provides the annual funding. Um, we have uh, always consistently operated efficiently and been under what it was projected to cost, $10 million a year to operate the program in Manitoba. We've uh, been significantly under that in community, individual, corporate, uh, municipal support helps, uh, like I said, the stability of us not having to rely on one funding source. Um, so uh, our municipal initiative across Western Canada and, Ma in, and particularly here in Manitoba, we, Manitoba has a growing aging population, increase in call volume of 6 to 10 percent every year, increasing operational costs, fuel, etc. Um, STARS is really part of your emergency protective services right here in Portage of the Prairie. We keep your community safer. Um, by reducing risk and mitigating challenges with chain of survival partners. When we transport a patient to Winnipeg, we keep your ground uh, uh, resources here on the ground in the community. Uh, we support rural health care delivery by increasing access for rural Manitobans to state-of-the-art medical treatment, enabling local emergency medical providers to remain in their community instead of traveling with patients long distances to urban hospitals. So a little bit about your community, just to wrap up. Um, Mission volumes last year, 35 missions. Uh, as you can see, 13 scene calls and 22 <coughs> inter-facility transfers. And we're very excited for the opening this spring of the helipad, which this community uh, did an amazing job coming together to make that happen. And you can see the, the missions are growing on a yearly basis, 33 in 16 and 17, and uh, 17 missions in 15 and 16. Portage was 85 missions in the past three years. Portage was the second busiest destination for STARS in Manitoba in 17 and 18. Uh, so our request to you tonight is to number one, help us spread the word about the Radiothon. It will be on uh, CFRY, Mix 96, and um, the name of the third station is... Sorry? That's right. It was just failing me for a moment. Uh, on the 16th and 17th, I believe, Mayor Ferris, you're uh, going to be uh, part of that, and I think you're, you've already recorded uh, your presentation or, or about to, um, and we really thank you for your participation. So please spread the word and let everybody know um, what's happening. I know you're leaders in the community, and so you get asked, and that's why we wanted to, uh, to let you know about that. Our request uh, that we'd ask you to... Uh, uh, graciously consider is to recognize STARS as a valued partner of your emergency protective services, uh, enhance the safety and quality of life, uh, that enhances the safety and quality of life of your residents, and help ensure the sustainability of STARS emergency services for Manitobans. STARS belongs to all Manitobans. Uh, your kind consideration to join with STARS and some 40 uh, other municipalities in the province with the Pledge of Support annually through your Protective Services budget would be gratefully um, received. And uh, are there any questions? Well, Michael, thank you very much for coming out and presenting. And uh, we're certainly me. looking forward to the Radiothon and, and also getting our helipad, getting, the, uh, getting it finally finished this spring. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, one question, Councillor Draycott. Could I ask, just because it's not in your presentation, does STARS have a monetary value that they're <laughs> requesting from our community? Um, many uh, communities in Manitoba um, uh, have chosen the figure of a dollar per capita. Others have just chosen a, uh, a, a figure. Um, you know, and we have uh, communities in Manitoba who supported us all the way from Five hundred or thousand dollars to five or six thousand dollars. I believe out of the forty or so communities who have 
supported us in the last, uh, it's only been in the last year so that we've been actively seeking uh, this type of support. It's about a dozen who've done the dollar per capita. Um, in Alberta, uh, it's over $2 million a year in municipal support. Um, and that's a, a program that's been uh, going on uh, over 20 years. And other than that, I'd just like to also mimic what the mayor did say. Thank you very much for your work that you do around our community. I get Thank to you, see Councilor. that firsthand with my husband being on the fire department. And so uh, you definitely are an asset to our community and uh, our first responders. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Can I just ask? Uh, Councillor Preece. Just out of uh, curiosity, are there any plans to expand your service into northern Manitoba or northwestern Ontario, or are there already services in those areas? There is a service that covers northwestern Ontario that the Government of Ontario contracts with. Um, but I will let Grant uh, answer that. Uh, yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, beyond our um, range, uh, the north is served by fixed wing providers. So the, the Manitoba Life Flight Program is a jet that provides critical care to the far outreaches. So the Paw, Flin Flon, Thompson, those areas. So uh, to, at, at this point, uh, with the majority of the population and the range we're covering, I think this is probably the best place for it in terms of efficiency. But uh, know that those communities are well served by our fixed wing partners, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any further questions from council? Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'll just close by saying um, it, we are always, uh, our base is at the Winnipeg uh, Richardson International Airport, uh, and uh, we would be pleased to host any of you to come, uh, or council as a whole to come uh, and visit us and see the helicopter. It's, uh, it's an amazing uh, thing to see, and it really is a flying ER in the sky, and it's an amazing resource for Manitoba. We'd love to have you as our guest someday, and uh, you could certainly contact uh, Grant or myself, and uh, your administration and the mayor knows how to, to get a hold of us, and we'd, we'd uh, be thrilled to see you at, at our base. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Okay, hey, we'll open the public hearing for tax levy bylaw 18-8671. Is there anyone here to speak in favor or opposed to the bylaw? Mr. Mr. Knott? And then we've got another speaker, Mr. Maxwell. Mr. Knott first. Mr. Mayor, Councillor, Councils, thank you for allowing me to speak to a tax bylaw. Late last year, Council passed a motion which stated that not necessarily the lowest bid would be accepted at any, for any tender. In this coming financial bylaw, financial plan, there's quite a few million dollars available for structural infrastructure works. Uh, I noted four million dollars for the bridge, just as an example. Will Council be adhering to this policy that not necessarily the lowest bid will be accepted on any tender? Okay, this is your time to make your presentation, Mr. Knott. It's not question period, so go ahead. Well, I'll leave that as a question for you all to think about for yourselves. Um, I can't ask questions. I thought I could. You no, know, you could speak to the uh, tax levy bylaw for or against. Ah, okay. Let me sort things out for a moment, sir. Put in the newspaper as a public notice regarding the 2018 financial plan. Council will hear any person who wishes to make a representation, ask questions, or register an objection to the financial plan. I can't ask questions, that's fine. I thought I could from the notice to the public. October the 25th, some or all of you may not be here. 
as your legacy, whatever you decide between now and then on the financial plan for structural infrastructure work uh, will stay with you and your reputation. If you're all happy about what you've decided in terms of spending money on the bridge, then so be it. Um, I would ask you to think about the fact that if the bridge is going to be worked on this year, there may or may not be a totally different council next year who would have to live with whatever you decide. If in your best thoughts and interests and plans things have come up and you thought this is really, this is the way it should be, then I, I guess that's what's going to happen. Not having to ask questions, what else can I say? You guys know what you're doing in terms of finances. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Knott. Um, Mr. Maxwell? <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, members of council, city employees, my citizens. My name is Danny Maxwell, and I'm here to speak on the tax incentive we want to give to the people on Meehan Avenue. Sorry, Mr. Maxwell, this is about the tax levy bylaw. Oh, sorry, I thought I had the wrong one. Thank you. You're here to speak to the tax levy bylaw? I'm here to ask why, after advertising that in the public notice for this meeting, it specifically said questions could be asked, why are you now refusing to let citizens ask questions when that was in your public notice? Well, there will be a question period at the end of committee, and if anybody else would like to present about the tax levy bylaw 18-8671, speaking in favor or opposed to the bylaw, this is the time to do it. Question period is limited to 15 minutes, and when you're having a public hearing, I don't view that as fair. And that is counter to what you advertised. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak to the tax levy bylaw 1886-71? For or opposed? Last call. Mr. Oshis? Mayor, <coughs> councillors, my first time here. Wish I would have had a tour when I was a kid, but that's the way it goes. <clears throat> um, sorry. Um, is this the time to uh, make a presentation as far as budget? Or is it just... This is to speak to the tax levy bylaw, so for or against, if you've got suggestions in the budget uh, okay. that's going to be presented, or... Sure. Or, or compliments, too, either, either <laughs> way. I'll, I'll let the citizens decide on the compliments. Um, this pertains to the upcoming budget. Abbas Burris entered us as a balanced budget. Um, one of the first tenders that went out this spring was the mowing tender, which I applied for. It's, I'm going to go green lawn and landscaping. And last, on April 9th, it was awarded to a Dr. Green for 550000 sorry, $505,687.57, including GST. My bid on that same contract was $80,000 less. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, I would like an explanation as to why um, the low bid was not taken in this case. I understand there was a rating system which rated... Um, Mr. Oshis, you're speaking to or against the financial plan tax against levy it, I bylaw. guess. That would be against it. Okay. Can I carry on now? Uh, I haven't been here before. Okay, so um, we're, we're talking about the financial plan right now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, if you've got other questions, we have question period at the end of committee. But this is, this is part of the budget, sir. Okay. Um, my ex explanation from council to the citizens why um, council um, approved a tender that was $80,000 more as then budgeted. Not only was that 80000 was over budget and mine was 80000 less under budget, and contrary to the bid format, section 19.02, 
The city may reject all or part of any bid or waive requirements if in the sole discretion of the city, the interest of the city so required. The city reserves a right not to award a tender if the low valid tender price exceeds the city budget. Can I ask why the, the, the budget, I mean the, the awarding of the tender, $80,000 more was not rejected and yeah. why is it put into budget? Yeah, Mr. Oshis, um, that's probably better for question period. Right now, you're, you're presenting on the budget. Okay. You're telling council what you, what you think of the tax bylaw. That's what I'm supposed to be saying? That, that, that's what this, uh, this hearing is for, but later on we have question period okay. after committee. Then I can wait for later? Sure. Okay, that's fine. Like I said, I haven't been here, so. That's fine. Is there anyone else here to speak to the tax levy bylaw 18-8671? For or against? I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I'll move to close public hearing for tax bylaw 18-8671. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Draycott. All those in favor? And that's carried. All right, the first item that um, there's a couple of reports here in PDF format, but the one that I'll be drawing attention to for the first for Council's uh, consideration is the actual presentation. So it is a, yeah, it's up on the screen there now. So it's our 2018 financial plan in the summarized format and several slides, which I'll walk through um, and obviously answer any questions. This is the final document and kind of the, the plan is something that captures all of the work put forth in uh, previous discussions we've had. Um, pull for that. No, you can. Yeah. Uh, previous discussions that we've had with regards to our budget and our debt management plan or capital plan. Um, then we waited uh, to see what was happening with the school division. We received that. And finally, we have to uh, submit our financial plan to the province of Manitoba. And that is what we're doing here tonight. So, again, um, multiple documents put forth into one uh, final document being our financial plan. So I'll just start with our planning cycle. Um, this has not really uh, changed a whole bunch and just outlines to everybody exactly what the city and uh, all of the teams that contribute to the, to the budget and the planning cycle do and when they do that. Um, you can see that this is a continuous uh, revolvement of information in the time that we uh, are done presenting this. We're already at works and planning for the next year. So this is a continual moving uh, target. The 2018 budget themes, uh, and this goes for budget as well as capital planning, but basically we followed, uh, we wanted to make sure that there was a 0% increase in operating budget. We wanted to manage and prepare for the growth that we knew were coming, and we wanted to really invest back in our community through the enhancement of walking paths, parks, and community grants. I believe all of which we were able to accomplish. Achieving 0%, it provide, or provided us with some challenges, uh, but, and there was some balancing that had to take place. We had to, uh, the challenges that we are facing is managing the growth. It's coming very, very quickly for us and something that uh, this community has not seen in uh, numerous years. In fact, the question would be historically, has the city ever faced this amount of growth in the amount of time that we're looking at it happening? Uh, we have a tremendous amount of assets, um, all of which, uh, many of which require future investment, um, the community value. So the investment that we put into things, uh, the community wants to see value and sometimes it can't be seen because it might be underground, et cetera and the services. There is a continued demand on the services of the City of Portage and uh, funds that we have to, uh, to balance in putting into those services. We want to make sure we remain as efficient as possible through this process. We want to invest in technology along the way and we really change a little bit of our approach from a risk rated perspective to understand what is the risk of non-investment uh, to our community going future. And it, although the priorities didn't change in our community, um, some of the uh, ones that come to the forefront did. So what are some of the major projects in 2018 uh, that will be underway? We did hear uh, in previous uh, conversations, the Island Bridge will get phase one um, of its uh, investment in 2018. Uh, the City uh, Council has approved the direction for the bridge and so now it's phase one of that. Um, investment ready Southeast Development McMillan Industrial Park. So again, getting uh, preparing for that growth with major infrastructure uh, investments, that is the theme you'll see through this, it's investments in infrastructure. Water systems in our treatment and wastewater uh, plants, uh, we know there's a major investment going on there. 
Uh, lots of work, and again, understanding the assets uh, that the city has uh, under its administration to, to work on, and accessibility. We know that the um, province of Manitoba has passed an Accessibility Act, and the city uh, is required to address that act, and uh, we are working on ensuring that we're doing uh, that for compliance. So water is something that uh, this council, council before, whether it be uh, fresh water or wastewater, has been a topic of conversation and a requirement for a tremendous amount of investment. Phase one at our wastewater plant, uh, we are preparing for Roquette, the Simplot expansion. We just recently heard of some uh, additional developments at McCain's and other industrial partners. Um, so that is a major, major investment. That's phase one. And phase two being our water treatment plant upgrade. So um, a low rate antibiotic, and an aerobic reactor is used for industrial customers' waste pretreatment. So basically that's a settling out of solids through a process and a major investment uh, required. We did just recently talk about the accessibility here uh, in our city. And so phase one in 2018, we do have to again look at a feasibility study. This is not to say that there's been a work already done in this regard, but there is future uh, work that's required as again, uh, the assets of the city, we have to make sure that we do as much as possible to address this. Phase two um, in 2019 is actually again looking at the city hall. This has been an, an item of conversation for quite some time in terms of accessibility, um, but we do have to take a look at what options there are uh, for this building and how we can make it uh, more readily accessible. So the 2018 budgeted results after all being said, um, uh, generally, there's revenue of $21 million and expenses of $21 million. And on the utility side, $11 million and $11 million. Again, going with that uh, balanced budget approach. Um, may need to uh, just boost up the size of that just for citizens to kind of view. But the representation is in a pie chart uh, on where revenues do come in. Uh, about 53% of revenues for the city does come through property taxes. There's transfers from reserves that are established within the city. Um, there's some tax sharing agreements. There's sales of city services. Uh, there's grants from the federal government. We do earn some revenue from licensing, uh, both provincial government, sorry, and federal government grants, um, and fines and fees and penalties. So that gives you a representation of just where the funds come from from the city with basically 50% of it coming from property taxes. And then once you get your revenue in, where is those money spent? 28%, um, we'll say, for easy figuring, almost 30% of that goes into protective services. Um, so we also, again, when we put that money in, we have to put some into reserves uh, to plan for the future. So there's a component of that that goes into there. Into there. Um, recreation and culture makes up a significant portion of our budget as well. And you can see um, the other areas that draw on the funds. So, um, there is multiple areas, this is, a, this is a summary, but multiple areas for the demands of funds from the city uh, once they're received. So that was on the general side, but switching to the utility, and again, those are two separate um, kind of operating entities, is our general and then our utility. And uh, you can see that there's a very significant um, um, amount of money coming from government funding for this particular upcoming year for our wastewater plant phase one. Uh, we do uh, get uh, water sales, obviously, both from an industrial and residential component, and regional water is sold as well. So you can see where the revenues are coming in for this 2018 year. So utility expenses, again, uh, as outlined, we have a considerable amount of money being spent in our improvements in those areas, but we have to maintain um, a lot of the, again, infrastructure that we have in the utility side and a lot of the dollars that we get in go right back out to investment in that uh, long-standing infrastructure. So we talk about mill rate and uh, the city was um, you know pretty aggressive when we said this year despite all this growth we wanted to maintain a zero percent zero percent tax increase and so we did that with maintaining our mill rate. Um, we did actually have the school division come in a little bit lower than the previous year and again we collect uh, taxes for the school division and then remit so you can see that from 2017 uh, to 18, um, the overall mill rate um, dropping from 34.657 to 34.503. And so, um, you know, it, it is a good news story in our community for residential. And then you can see uh, the same type of a trend in uh, the commercial side of things. So what would be the impact on, uh, on property taxes based on a house assessed at, assessed at $250,000? 
you're looking at a small decrease in taxes um, in the city of Portra Prairie uh, for that year, 2018. This is not unlike any other year, so there will be an opportunity for people to uh, take a look at the assessed value of their property, um, and then they can do that on the, on the Province of Manitoba assessment site, and you can compare to your 2017 property bill and then use the tax implicator or the tax impact calculator uh, that will be available on our website. So it's uh, pretty user-friendly. Again, another graph just uh, representing uh, mill rates, uh, historical mill rates here in Portage. Uh, you can see that uh, there was kind of a steady increase in mill rates for a number of years and then a corresponding um, attempt to reduce our mill rate. And uh, this council has been pretty open during its term in terms of uh, recognizing the importance of being competitive in our region when it relates to mill rates and investment. And so the next slide kind of points out that uh, you know, a good work has been done here uh, in Portage, but uh, there are still additional pressures when we do our comparison to our peers for mill rates in, uh, right across the board. In, in just uh, even in 17, if you look at uh, Dauphin, Thompson, Steinbach, and Brand, still Portage leading the way uh, in our mill rates. So the competition is out there, and uh, we continue to have that on our minds. Mentioned a little bit about um, us moving towards a risk-rated asset management view and a different lens, and so our 10-year capital plan expanded to include risk evaluation on all assets. And so how do we determine that risk? We basically said likelihood to occur. There was a scale from remotely to certain, and so management was asked to go through those list of assets and say, um, if there's a requirement for replacement, is there a risk associated with not doing that action? Is that risk remote or is it certain? And so you can identify the risk, but what's the impact if you did not uh, understand that uh, something needed to be replaced and, and uh, overlooked the impact, it could be a minimal impact or it could be severe. And so then you uh, then go one step further and say, if it was severe, how severe will it be? And uh, so this process really helped to identify uh, areas of investment clear as it relates to the risk of uh, not being able to provide the services to uh, the citizens of Portage. So this is an ongoing uh, process in asset management. There's going to be some spring uh, Association of Manitoba Municipality workshops. Uh, we're going to do some upgrades and some software here for asset management, and there's more training planning uh, to be held for administration. And so it really is, uh, this is kind of a, it's going to be fed from er every area and every department of our city, and uh, the longer we continue to put information into this system, uh, the better it will get and more refined it will become. So just touching on our 10-year capital plan, I'm just highlighting a few <coughs> items over $1 million. And I think it's important to remember that this city for a long time has uh, run on a 10-year capital project plan, and it's not a requirement, actually. It's only a five-year requirement, but uh, we do want to project out uh, and identify those areas of investment uh, 10 years and beyond. So we do look at Saskatchewan Avenue. There are some uh, potential timelines on there, and our total 10-year amount is uh, $16 million. We still have our overlay and paving program outlined. Um, the beginning part of the uh, um, Island Park Bridge is 2018. You can see the asterisks there, but there's more investment in 2019. Land drainage, industrial park roads, and heavy equipment renewal, all things that continually are ongoing um, through our city. So you can see projects over $1 million, $36 million in investment. The utility, um, several items again continue to relate to our improvements over there. Um, but you know, once you have this type of infrastructure, it does require ongoing investment. I won't go through every one of those items, but you can see that there's ongoing items and then um, two year, multiple year projects as well as one year. And again, over a period of time, over a million dollars, $25 million. As noted, in 2018, 10-year capital plan has been expanded to include all assets. The impact is capital assets or asset groups that could require replacement in 2029 and beyond. Generally, uh, in our general fund, we'll call it, there's 12 separate capital asset groups, and uh, that totals $178 million of those, as I mentioned before, kind of assets under administration. And a utility fund, um, we've narrowed that a little bit, but there's still kind of 10 separate distinct capital groups totaling uh, $537 million in assets. And so that does exclude the ongoing enhancements of the water, wastewater treatment plant. So when you look at it through that lens, um, there is a tremendous amount of infrastructure required for um, continual improvement there, both on the general and the utility side. 
so I, I have uh, included our funding for our 10-year capital plan and so I again I won't go through those all but it does show that there is a reserve uh, withdrawals there is some debenture borrowings um, through that 10-year plan and um, and the areas where uh, those items are going to be spent on so you see general infrastructure equipment replacement reserve that type of stuff so we are putting money away and then we have to access those reserves uh, when the spending is required so in speaking of reserves just providing a little bit of a highlight on what the reserve balances are in uh, 2018 forecasted to be there is separate reserves that we uh, do hold and they're outlined as followed as follows sorry so one uh, would still wonder what does that do for outstanding debt here at the city um, there is a reduction of almost nine hundred thousand dollars between 2017 and 18 um, you can see that there's both general and utility um, there's no new debt to be assumed by the city in 2018 and our annual debt payments um, are approximately 1.8 million dollars 1.3 million of that is principal and about um, half a million dollars is interest so all being told um, the city is in in good shape to um, deal with some of the growth that we'll be facing um, in the near future so again there's additional information on uh, our website the tax impact calculator our complete <coughs> financial plan uh, the budget speech that i outlined some time ago which is inclusive of our 2018 grants so that concludes the presentation portion of the and i will move into kind of the more administrative um, document so i've outlined already um kind of the uh, the t the change in the mill rate uh for from the province or sorry from our city that will be remitted to the the province as well as the collection of the city or sorry the school divisions um for 2018 the tax deadline is tuesday july 31st uh, which will be noted on all property bills advertised and advertised on the city's website um, based on the municipal act and the city's prior tax revenue the maximum debt for the city is 20.2 million dollars i think that's also important um, but as i just mentioned as we left that last slide um, with the remaining debt outstanding of approximately 8.2 uh, million as of december 31st the city is using only about 40.6 percent of its debt capacity and so no new utility debt will be outstanding in, at the end of this year and most existing general debt will mature between 2024 and 25. and so while one would think that uh, the reserve funds and the ability to borrow capacity is healthy we are embarking on an exciting times for portage in our community and significant investments announced by roquette and simplet are starting to spur on other developments in our city so it is um, we've put ourselves in the right place uh, again to balance this growth so it is the recommendation of the committee, and I so move that the bylaw 18-8671 be a bylaw of the city of Portage Parade to authorize a levying and raising of property taxes for school and municipal purposes for the year ending December 31st, 2018, be given first reading. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Wall. Uh, questions or comments on the motion? Well, I have a... Um, I have a comment, uh, Mr. Buds. I just want to thank you and I want to thank administration and the council for all the work that's gone into this. This was a uh, course that was set a number of years ago, three or four years ago. Uh, I think people have heard me talk about the mill rate and I've certainly heard about it over the years from business, uh, business people and others in the community that we have the notoriety of being in the top third, not in a good way in the province as far as mill rates goes. So this will take us, um, to a point where we're actually reducing the mill rate, making us more competitive, and certainly getting us ready for the growth that we're not just anticipating, but which is actually underway. So again, I want to thank, I know a lot of hard work went into this by administration, and I want to thank uh, the administrative team and uh, yourself and council for this. Councilor Draycott? I would just like to uh, note that a lot of work has gone into this financial plan this year to make us more of a community that's not reactionary. And so that's a very positive step in my uh, point of view uh, from our administration and our financial team, just to make sure that with the growth that we are anticipating to come to the city and we are seeing happening already, uh, that we don't get ourselves in a point in a couple of years down the road where we wonder how we're going to pay for things. 
And so as much as the trend is our friend, I am the counselor that states that that can't always be possible. I am happy to see that that is the situation for this year's financial plan. Other questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion. And that's carried. So we'll open the public hearing for variation PC 20 18. Nalco Developments. Nalco Developments Limited. Is there anyone here to speak to the hearing from Nalco Developments? Just to answer questions? Okay. You're not here to speak to this hearing, are you, Mr. Nickard? Well, uh, well, all I want to say is that uh, it's, I understand it's been approved and uh, we're a few days late, uh, so we have to reapply. Okay. Okay. Uh, I need a motion to close the hearing. Results at the public hearing for variation PC 20-18, Melco Developments Limited, now be closed. Moved by Councillor Adriger and seconded by Councillor Fraze. All those in favor? And that's carried. Okay, the issue at hand is that Melco, Melco Developments Limited are applying for a variation order to allow for the front yard site requirement to be reduced as uh, they would like to match the front yard setbacks to houses at uh, 10 and 12 Spence Lane and keep the street uniform. These buildings are in an R1 residential single family zone. The application has been circulated to various city departments with operations commenting on the following. That the developer should have designed the lots and subdivision accordingly or built smaller homes. Six meters is not adequate for many vehicles to park in front of the house and not be encroaching on boulevard or sidewalks. The application applied for and received variation order PC 8-17 that has since expired. The applicant would like to apply for the same variation again. The minute reference number 2017-0040. The applicant has also applied for and received a similar variation order PC 4-18 this year. Minute reference number 2018-0023. Public notices have been sent to all property owners within a 100 meter radius. It is the recommendation that the Council of the City of Portage of Prairie approve the variation request of Melco Developments Limited to vary the front yard site requirement of 7.5 meters to be reduced to 6 meters at the property known as 6, 8, 14, 16, 18 Spence Lane, which is legally described as lots 1, 2, 5 to 7, block 3, plan 53601, Parish of Portage of Prairie, and I so move. Moved by Councillor Dreger and seconded by Councillor. Uh, Buds, um, any comments or questions on the motion? Councillor Dreger? I have a question for Malco Developments. Um, I would just like to hear your um, point of view on uh, on the comment made by city departments for the city leaders. Sorry, Councillor Dreger. It just, it's questions for members of the council. Okay. This time. So. Could I ask for the city department yes. operations? Yes. Um, about the six meters. Is that because of the car lengths or um, Kelly, can you speak to that? Uh, yeah, that's that's correct. Six meters uh, reverse the uh, vehicle length. Any other questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion. And that's carried. We'll move into finance, legislative, and property committees. Councillor Buds, please. Thank you. A couple items on uh, my committee's agenda here tonight. Uh, we're going to have second reading for our local vehicles for hire. And so I won't go into a lot of detail on here. As council knows, this is an item that we discussed in committee and then gave this uh, bylaw first reading in our last meeting. 
Before I move into a motion to accept a second reading of this bylaw, I know that uh, we did have an individual that uh, was corresponding with the administration uh, with regards to some concerns and just asking for um, a little bit of an update from administration on um, how that process went and have we got that, um, that uh, those questions um, answered or articulated. I'll pass on your question to Ms. McFarland. Um, the individual that was at the meeting has not come in and spoke to us. Okay, thank you. So again, I'm not going to go through this. We've outlined that we're uh, increasing uh, fees. Uh, we know who uh, can and cannot um, enforce our bylaw. Um, and we know uh, that, that this is definitely a, a bylaw that does a, a deal with um, the, the possibility of having a different type of uh, vehicle for hire in our community, the Uber style. So it is a recommendation of the committee and I so move that the Council of State of Portage Prairie give second reading to the local vehicles for hire bylaw 18-8666. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Wall. Any comments or questions on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And finally, that bylaw 18 866 be read a third time, finally passed, signed, and sealed, and that 2018 fees and charges schedule be re revised accordingly. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Wall. All those in favor? And that's carried. My next item is um, second and third reading on the establishment of an infrastructure uh, gen uh, infrastructure and general reserve fund. And so I just came off a financial plan uh, conversation with regards to identifying a numerous amounts of assets um, that require future investment. And I think we were as, uh, thank you, Councillor Dr uh, Draycott for identifying um, this council's willingness to be proactive in identifying things. And I think this is another step in that regard by proactively setting aside funds in our each budget cycle for specifically dealing with infrastructure and establishing that uh, infrastructure general reserve. Not to be confused with our regular general reserve fund. This one's um, sole purpose is to uh, deal with infrastructure. And so it is a recommendation of the committee and I so move that the council of City of Portage Prairie give second reading to the infrastructure general reserve bylaw 18-8667. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Wall. Any uh, comments or questions on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And that bylaw 18 8667 be read a third time, finally passed, signed, and sealed. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Dreger. All those in favor? And that's carried. Next item up is uh, an item that we did discuss in uh, committee uh, last meeting, which is our lease agreement with Coco Plax Rec Club. I know um, Mr. Pito and, and representatives from that group have uh, have been negotiating back and forth in terms of renewing that agreement. The terms of the, the uh, agreement have continued since the expiry of the original one, which was back in 2013. And now there's just a few changes uh, on the agreement. Um, the city now ensures the premises under our policy with the club responsible for their deductible and the claim. The city's park staff will provide 40 hours of labor uh, per year uh, when requested and as time allows, and the lease can be terminated upon mutual agreement between the parties. That's the highlights of the changes, and the rest of it is uh, straightforward. It is the recommendation of your committee and I so move that the Council of the City of Portage Prairie approve the lease agreement with the Coca Platz Community Club Incorporated for 10 years, starting on May 1, 2018, and expiring on April 30, 2028. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Freeze. Any uh, questions or comments on the motion? Councillor Draycott? Just in regards to the 40 hours of labor, was this something that we were able to combine with our new position that operations put in place last year, Mr. Braden? Uh, we have been doing some work there uh, over the years. Uh, this just formalizes things. Thank you. Any further questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion. And that's carried. My next item up is the safety officer funding agreement uh, for councils, uh, um, for just providing council with some background. This was an agreement that we had. It was a tri-party agreement with the RM, the PRA, and the city. Uh, we have since been uh, made aware that the RM uh, does not wish to uh, renew this agreement and, and as such there's some changes that are required where the city and the PRA are going to want to continue on uh, with a um, 
with agreement, both sharing those services and the, the amount and days that we'll be sharing is outlined in the agreement. Um, again, this is something that we did cover off in a previous committee meeting. So it is a recommendation of the committee and I so move that the Council of the City of Portage Prairie approves the safety officer funding agreement with the Portage Regional Recreation Authority. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Wall. Any uh, questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And my final um, item is um, just for us to have a, a, a real good understanding that uh, our um, non-arms length um, Portage Regional Recreation Authority is entering into an agreement uh, to manage the campground out at Delta. And I think this is, uh, this is, an un this is a memorandum of understanding is uh, going to be executed to, just so council is aware and we have it on record that we were okay with that happening. Uh, both councils have met to discuss this and both have agreed that this is the course of action that the PRA uh, will embark on for 2018. I know uh, David and his crew over there have been working hard and I was in a meeting today that uh, they're hoping to, have, to go and visit that site again uh, very shortly to outline a few of the other requirements. So they are excited about taking this on. But again, this uh, memorandum of understanding will um, actually uh, have a, a document uh, that we will have uh, that we say that we're we're okay with that. So it is uh, the recommendation of the committee and I also move that the council of city of Portage Prairie authorize the mayor and the city manager to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the RM of Portage and the Portage Regional Recreation Authority regarding the operation and maintenance of Delta Beach Campground for the 2018 and 2019 fiscal and operating years. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Wall. Any uh, questions or comments on this motion? Councillor Draycott. Just a question in regards to what happens after that 2019 fiscal operating year. Uh, has PRRA and the RM come to any conclusion as to what that process will look like to see if this is a mutually agreeable relationship? So that is the reason it was a two-year agreement versus a one-year agreement. So it's uh, they're going to in, to kind of review uh, post one year is to see um, will this continue? Is this something that the PRA will continue to be involved in in the overall management? Um, and that'll be yet to be determined. So they're not looking beyond 2019 at this point. Okay, thank you. Any further questions on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And that does conclude my report. Thank you, Councillor Buds. We're going to move into City Planning and Economic Development Committee. Councillor Dreger, please. This committee has nothing to report at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Community Service Committee, Councillor Fraze. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship. The Community Service Committee has nothing to report. Thank today. you. Waterworks Committee, Councillor Wall. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, this has to do with the award of the contract for the 2018 land application of biosolids from the Water Pollution Control Facility as per tender 18 OPS 007. The tender for the land application of biosolids for the Water Pollution Control Facility was posted on Merck's website as well as on the City of Portage La Prairie website on February 16, 2018, with submissions due by March 16, 2018. This work involves the removal of approximately 1,000 dry tons of solids material from the bulk volume fermenter, as well as two biosolid storage tanks as biosolids to be transported and injected onto farmland as fertilizer. 10 copies of the tender were requested. Two bids were received. The bids were evaluated as per the scoring criteria outlined in the tender. The evaluation committee was comprised of three staff members who are very familiar with Biosolids Land Application Program. The points were awarded as follows. The uh, total points available were 100. Assiniboine injections received 99.3 and WESUC incorporated 80.6 points. The 2018 budget for land application of biosolids is $560,000 plus GST. The budget includes an additional 300 dry tons of biosolids to be land applied. However, the new low rate anaerobic reactor will require sludge material for seeding during commissioning. This volume of sludge will be transferred from the existing bulk volume fermenter to the new low rate anaerobic reactor and will not need to be land applied. This volume was removed from the tender and the tender specifies that volumes are estimates and are not guaranteed. With the actual volume of biosolids to be removed will be determined once storage tanks are emptied. 
Cinnaboyne Injections received the most points and has been determined to provide the best value for money. Cinnaboyne Injections Limited has been the provider of biosolids land application services for the City of Portage for over 14, 15 years and administration has been satisfied with the quality of service that's been provided. The recommendation is, and I so move, that the Council of the City of Portage La Prairie award the contract for the land application of biosolids for the 2018 season to Assiniboine Injections Limited for a total contract price of $403,920 plus GST. Moved by Councillor Wall and seconded by Councillor Dreger. Any uh, questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. <coughs> uh, we also have a, uh, an annual report from the Wastewater Division uh, for information. And uh, in going through that report, uh, it's quite apparent that it's, it's been a challenging year at the uh, wastewater facility with uh, very high solids coming from industry. They did, however, manage to take one sequencing batch reactor basin down for repairs uh, this year for inspection and repairs, which hasn't been done in several years and is uh, quite necessary. That takes about 25% of our treatment capacity uh, out of availability for a period of time. But uh, they coped with that rather well and uh, also had some challenges in uh, uh, staffing with uh, people leaving uh, a death uh, in uh, of one of our members of the facility maintenance crew. And overall, uh, I'd like to commend the staff and management of the Water Pollution Control Facility on achieving very good treatment results uh, with all the challenges they had to face. And that's all I have this evening. Well, thank you, Councillor Wall. Uh, transportation, Councillor Draycott. Thank you, Worship. Nothing for council meeting this evening. Thank you. And um, public safety, uh, Councillor Fraze for Councillor Espy. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. The issue that we do have tonight is the updating the City of Portage of Prairie Emergency Preparedness Bylaw. And it's a bylaw that was passed back in 1994, since which time there have been some changes and regulations have been updated. And this a review was done to make the current bylaw comply with the current regulations. So highlights of the new bylaw are, number one, that a municipal emergency coordinator and deputy emergency coordinator be established as designated officer positions. And secondly, that the Director of Public Safety is appointed as the Municipal Emergency Coordinator. And thirdly, that the duties of the emergency organization will be or have been reviewed and updated. And with that work completed, it's the administrative recommendation that the Council of the City of Portage of Prairie move, approve the Emergency Preparedness Bylaw 18-8668 by giving it first reading. Moved by Councillor Fraze and seconded by Councillor Draycott. Any uh, questions or comments on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. And that concludes uh, the public safety report, Councillor Fraze? Yes, that concludes the public safety report. Thank you. We have no deferred business. However, we do have some new business. Uh, zoning bylaw amendment PC 1618 and bylaw 1886-80. This is for first reading. Councillor Dreger, please. Thank you, Worship. The uh, property in question here is lot seven, block six, plan 1657. This is the corner of Bridge Road and Henderson Drive. Uh, council considered and carried. Um, a request for variation a uh, number of meetings ago and this time this section of land is coming to us for a uh, zoning amendment. Uh, the owner would like to rezone uh, the property from an R160 residential family to an R2 residential family and uh, this application has been circulated to the 
or will be circulated to the province for uh, review and comment after first reading. So what we're doing tonight is giving this first reading. And uh, first reading of bylaw number 18-8670 will commence the process as defined in the Planning Act. Um, the recommendation on, on this is that the C Council of the City of Portage of Prairie give bylaw number 18-8670 first reading and that public notices as defined in section 168 of the Planning Act be circulated. Moved by Councillor Dreger and seconded by Councillor Buds. Um, any comments or questions on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. Next I have a new business is uh, Erickson Heights Development Agreement. This is Finance and Properties Committee. Councillor Buds, please. Thank you. So our issue here tonight is to approve a development agreement with Erickson Heights Limited. Um, so just providing some background, and at the September 25th, 2017 meeting, Council approved a purchase agreement with Erickson Heights Limited for a six-acre parcel in the southeast part of the city, being part of Block B, Plan 35396, uh, in order for Erickson Heights to proceed with site construction, a development agreement is required between the city and the developer. So that is what we're doing tonight. Um, this is what the development ag agreement provides for. It provides for a two-phase plan with construction beginning on the west side of the land in the first phase and the east side in the second phase. The city to amend its zoning bylaw and development plan to rezone the land from agricultural to residential multiple family. Requires the developer to apply for a development permit and pay all fees determined by the 2018 fees and charges schedule. Um, it also uh, ensures that all costs incurred to be the responsibility of the developer. Construction will begin on property one by April 20th, 2019 and be completed within 16 months and begin on property two within five years of the agreement being executed and completed within 18 months. And any sale of that property by the developer would be negotiated with the city first. The Municipal Act and all relevant bylaws and permits processes uh, will be adhered to. So those are the things that are covered within the development agreement. It is an administrative recommendation, I so move, that the Council of City of Porch Prairie approve the proposed development agreement with Erickson, Erickson Heights Limited. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Wall. Any comments or questions on the motion? All those in favor of the motion? And that's carried. Next I have a new business is bylaw 18.862. This is for tax incentives. This is first reading. Uh, Councillor Buds, please. Thank you. Again, the issue here now is to determine whether tax incentives should be provided to the developer owner of rules 362.800 and 362.820 of the development that we commonly are referred to as Mean Estates. And so again, I'll provide some background here. Uh, Mean Estates and Vinell Holdings Partnership, referred to as Vinell, made a presentation to city councillors after our last council meeting. Uh, Vinell is proposing to purchase roll 36280 and 362800 and build four 32 multifamily buildings and four 12 unit condo life lease buildings. Vinell is an experienced property developer and a licensed multifamily condominium property, property management firm with operations in Brandon and Thompson. The build schedule is compact. Uh, with two 32 multifamily units commencing in mid-2018 and projected to be occupants re occupant ready by September and December of this same year. Further, two 12-unit condo life leases will commence building in 2018 with a longer period to occupancy ready by March of 2019. The condo and life lease units are expected to, lo to be located on top of a parking garage which requires a longer build period and a variation will be required for their building site which is zone C2 designated commercial. The multifamily property building is approximately zoned, or pro, sorry, appropriately zoned R3, and all buildings are expected to be three floors in height. In order to build and rent housing at a reasonable rental rate, tax incentives have been sought by this company and me and estates with the owner selling this property to the developer. Again, the multifamily units will be two and three bedroom units. So CMHC tracks vacancy rates for Canadian cities and they've identified that the city of Portage Prairie has a 1.5% vacancy rate for two bedroom apartments and no vacancies for three bedroom apartments. The city and its economic development office are aware that new and expanding industries in our community are currently seeking rental properties for their employees. It should be mentioned that tax incentives are not new to this city and to other Manitoba cities, particularly those wanting to incent developers to build inventory of affordable rental properties. 
In 2010, a tax discount was provided to the owners of Sage Grove Apartments for a 10-year period and a declining discount commencing at 100% and reducing 10% per year. The cities of Winkler, Dauphin and Steinbach have used tax incentives and discounts to incent developers to build their city's property inventory. So Mina Estates has been serviced uh, <coughs> by the city for the past several years as there are occupied, occupied home, housing units in the middle of the estate's land. No further infrastructure expenditures are required by the city in order to support further building on this land. Traffic counts, however, at uh, River and Meehan will be assessed in the next year to determine if traffic control beyond the installed stop signs is needed. It is noted uh, in this report that there are no cost or cash outlay requirements for the city. Uh, for the initial five years of each completed property, provided each property has been issued an occupancy permit by October 31st, 2021, the city will be collecting an approximate total of $568,000 less than if all regular property taxes were paid without discount. This amount assumes that all four 32-unit multifamily and all four 12-unit condo life lease buildings are built and have received their respective occupancy permits by October 31st, 2021. The incremental amount for each 32-unit multifamily building is $112,000 and $70,000 for each 12-unit condo life lease building with the offsets for the first year of schools taxes. And the Municipal Act does allow Council to establish financial system programs through a bylaw, and that's what we're here to do tonight. So it is a recommendation um, that the that bylaw 18-8672 be provided a tax incentive to Vinell Holdings Partnership on a maximum of four 32-unit multifamily buildings and four 12-condo life lease buildings for any of these buildings built and receiving occupancy permits by October 31st, 2021 for a five-year term which provides a tax incentive in year one of occupancy of 100%, 80% in year two, 60% in year three, 40% in year four, and 20% in year five with regular property tax payments commencing in year six and forward be given first reading. Moved by Councillor Buds and seconded by Councillor Wall. Questions or comments on the motion? Councillor Fraze. I have a couple of observations I feel I need to make it, and some serious reservations about this bylaw, which I plan to vote against. Uh, it's council, this council has worked very hard to find efficiencies in our operations uh, to reduce the tax burden to taxpayers while maintaining uh, our essential services. And a lot of thanks to Councillor Buds for leading that effort. But foregoing the tax revenues, which we ought legitimately to collect on these new buildings, will make it much more difficult in future to maintain those services and to provide any other amenities the city may need. Furthermore, I'm not sure that it's appropriate for council to provide tax relief in support of what are essentially are speculative real estate developments uh, we've, we're being rushed, I feel, to support and favor a specific development, which is another reservation I have. And all of this in the absence of any policy about what type of development we might support with the uh, tax abatement. In my research, most municipalities, including the ones listed, Dauphin, Steinbeck, that do provide a tax relief for housing developments do so only to non-profit organizations building very affordable housing units. Uh, this particular development uh, wouldn't fall into the guidelines of either non-profit or very affordable. So I have serious reservations about passing this by and intend to vote against it. Any further comments or questions on the motion? Councillor Dreger. Um, I have a couple of comments. The first is the uh, report that was sent out to council via email indicated that the city of Winkler doesn't have a tax discount incentive program for residential or multifamily housing yet tonight's report seems to indicate that they do and I think we all know that Winkler is one of the fastest growing um, cities uh, that we've uh, uh, witnessed in quite some time I too have reservations out about supporting this I believe that the developer is well established and uh, um, is a tax incentive is not going to make or break um, what they're proposing here. They are 
going to be realizing profits on, on their building regardless of if we give them this tax incentive or not. There was um, an amount um, indicated at the very end of the report that the city would be collecting an approximate total of 568000 less than if all regular property taxes were paid without discounts. In the past number of years, um, every time we've met for budget, we have been told that every $100,000 indicates 1% of taxes. And so this, this indicates to me that um, we're losing 4.5% of taxes by giving this incentive. And uh, as Councillor um, Fraze mentioned, we have kept our taxes very low in the last number of years. And um, I don't know how long that can, that can continue, but this might put a damper on some of that. And there's also been projects that have continually been pushed back simply because we didn't have the funds to do that. And I'm just not certain that this this is going to um, this is going to allow us to move forward with some of those those other projects that we could use this money for. Those are my comments. Councillor Buds. So, um, just in response to Councillor Dreger's comments, is that uh, the the funds that are outlined here is what the city would not uh, be realizing in additional taxes. But just to be clear. Our budgets are built in our capital planning. Do not consider these funds. And so it's not a situation where in the past that we've uh, um, not funded projects or not undergone any further investment because of this. And it's not like a, these are funds that we had once and now don't have and that we're giving those funds away. And so this is uh, something that's being considered based on um, a, of acquiring those um, tax revenues over a period of time that quite honestly weren't there before. And I think for any, uh, for council, um, I know this item was discussed and, and um, you know, we went back and forth on this particular item on, on many occasions and many discussions. And I think that, that if there is any, um, you know, perspective uh, that's put on this, it is, a, it is rental property that we're really focused on and in a very aggressive build schedule are the two things that stuck out on, on this. The other item for me, and I think um, I don't want to speak for all the rest of council, um, but I can tell that um, we have to be very careful as a council and have to be understanding that um, the issue of precedent. And so we've talked a little bit about precedent that's happened in our city, um, some of the comparable cities, but I think uh, I was speaking in my financial plan outline about what our city is focused or what we're experiencing. And this city has not seen this type of growth ever. Uh, quite honestly, and that goes from commercial development for real estate and development for rental development. And so we as a council have to be very prepared to deal with this and potentially more asks. And so the only thing I would say is if this is supported tonight, um, that we have to have our, our minds open for the potential for additional uh, asks of the city for graduated increase in revenue over a period of time on um, very significant investments. Further comments or questions? Councillor Wall. Yes, I'd like to uh, agree uh, with what uh, Councillor Buds has said, and uh, I'm looking forward to the $568,000 in tax revenues in years to come. We can certainly uh, use it. Thank you, Councillor Wall. Councillor Draycott, did you have a question or a comment? I guess my comment to uh, other members other members of council would be that uh, this is a very aggressive build. Uh, we can see that that's a very aggressive build, which is part of the uh, allure of it, I think, for this council is because of what Councillor Buds is talking about. We have a need in our community, not only for our existing residents, but for those that are coming in to do work in our community and those that will stay. Um, myself, what I see is a cost to the city if we were to go ahead and approve this bylaw. Uh, and provide this tax relief over a five-year period uh, is nothing. The cost to us is nothing right now. Uh, currently, we're not looking at increasing our services to our community in terms of protection or anything along that lines to address this particular uh, development that we are looking at any more than we would for any other development that happens within our city at this point in time. It might be that we get to the point where we have to consider our emergency services or our other services that we provide to our community and have tax increases as a result of that. However, this is a very short period of time with um, an aggressive build. So 
this will be coming to our city if we approve this and uh, there is a little bit of a tax relief but for years and years to come there will be taxes that are going to be paid by these developers in order to have their establishment within our city so um, along the lines of what Councillor Buds was speaking of uh, precedence is something that we that we consider when we make decisions within our community. Uh, I don't think that it's something that I would be opposed to hearing from other developers either if we are looking at the same type of development, some aggressive timelines, because this is a need in our community, which in the end has no cost to us to go forward with this. Okay, thank you, Councillor Draycott. Uh, Councillor Fraze? Could I make a quick response possibly to two things? One is the idea uh, Councillor Buzz raised that there has never uh, been an aggressive time of building in Portage. That's historically not accurate. There certainly were boom times in this city's past, uh, some of them fueled by land price speculation with disastrous results. Uh, yeah, we, we need a longer view of history, I believe. Uh, the other point is that growth is never free. It's every time you add people to a city, you increase the costs of doing business, the cost of increased traffic on the road, the cost of more books borrowed at the library, more visits to the pool and the park and so on, more. Uh, you can't have growth without expecting costs to increase and we need to collect the taxes exactly to cover those increased costs. You can't necessarily allocate them prior to expending them, but every time there's growth, there's cost. It's automatic, guaranteed. Okay, further questions or comments on the motion? Well, I would like to speak to the motion, so I'm going to ask Deputy Mayor Buds to assume the chair. Comments, Your Worship? Sorry. Comments? Yes. Um, first of all, what I'm going to say will make me about as popular as a skunk at a picnic with members of the gallery, but I'll say it anyway. I will be voting for this. Uh, I would love to be able to take the position Councillor Fraze and Councillor Dredger have taken, uh, but I can't take that. Um, we have a number of times in our history uh, when we've used incentives, one of the few levers that municipal government has is taxes as far as encouraging or discouraging certain types of development. And I can tell you right now, our vacancy rate for rentals is running at 1.5% uh, for two bedrooms, 0% for three bedrooms. Ironically, uh, about three o'clock this afternoon, I had a call from a lady desperately looking to rent someplace. I couldn't send her anywhere. I said, have you talked to Manitoba Housing? She'd already talked and they didn't have anything then. About four o'clock, I received um, a notification from one of my friends who happens to be a developer, and he's here this evening uh, speaking why we shouldn't do this. And uh, he spoke in his letter about assets. Uh, we shouldn't waste city assets. I want to be really, really clear. This is not money that we have. These are chickens that we should not be counting. We don't currently have this tax revenue. We will not have this tax revenue unless something gets developed there. When this proposal came out, we talked to the president. You've all heard me talk about president. I'm very big on that. We're setting precedent. Is this proper? Yeah, this has been done. In recent history, I know in my time, I remember the incentives that were used with uh, Victoria School when Red River Community College came to us and said, we're going to retrofit that old pile of bricks. We're going to spend $1 million. We need some tax relief. I believe I can get the details on it. It was over 10 years, and it seemed to work out very well. Uh, they don't always work out. Every progressive city of Manitoba does it. I talk to the mayors of Steinbeck and Winkler and Morden, and they do use these from time to time. And I can say to people in the development community in Portage La Prairie, we need rentals in this community. Currently, uh, the Pred Office is taking reservations for people that want to rent out their bedrooms. So if you have a project that you're thinking about that involves rentals in Portage La Prairie, come and see your council. There's not special treatment here. We're being very open about it, why we're doing it, what we're doing, and what kind of tax incentives they're getting. If any of you want to do something on the same kind of aggressive timeline that involves rentals, come and talk to us. We are open for business. Thank you very much. Okay, so any further comments? Uh, the resolution has been moved. Uh, any further comments at all? 
Councillor Draycott. I guess I would just like to uh, make a comment back to Councillor Frace. I hope that in the last four years of being on Council uh, that we have evolved a little bit. We've changed how we do budget, we've changed at our increases, and we're finally getting some growth. And I guess I would state as a councillor, I hope that we don't become a community that's afraid to grow. If we're looking at growth as an expense to our community, we need to plan for that, which we are doing, and we need to grow. Our community tells us all the time we need to grow. We need to grow our housing, we need to grow our businesses, we need to grow our community, we need to not be 13,000 people for the rest of our existence. So I hope that we can vote as a council as a community that's looking forward to and not afraid to grow. Thank you. I Councilor I Fraser. feel compelled to respond. Uh, Is I don't it, think I'm can afraid. I just, uh, am not discouraging communication between councillors, but if we are going to just go back and forth from councillor to councillor, um, just questioning the uh, how proactive this is, but I will definitely allow you to, to I guess, if, you're, if it's just a rebuttal, um, I'll ask council to see whether or not it's effective in the decision that we're making here tonight. Yeah, uh, if one of the points I raised that we're doing this in the absence of any policy. Uh, it sounds like we're being open and transparent and encouraging growth at any level. But in fact, this is a pretty specific ask and we don't have a policy about what we'd like to encourage. My experience in the past four years has been that anybody coming to ask for tax relief has not received even a hearing by council that there have been a number of projects uh, about to be built in this community that have been stalled by a council reluctant to support them. And uh, when tax relief has been requested by nonprofit organizations looking for a very small ask to help them provide shelter to homeless people, uh, there's been a flat out no, we don't do social uh, welfare. And this doesn't look like social welfare, this looks more like corporate welfare. So I'm uh, sorry, I remain opposed. Anything else, councillors? Okay. All those in favor as uh, moved, please raise your hand. Carried. Never leave your laptop unattended, even at a council meeting. Okay, uh, we have no old business, so we are going to adjourn council at 7.27 p.m. We're going to take a five-minute lifestyles health break, and we're going to come back to committee in five members' time. I just want to let people know committee is open to the public. It's open to the media, and question period will follow committee. So we'll see everybody in five minutes.
We'll call committee to order at 7.32 p.m. First up is uh, Finance, Legislative and Property Committee. Councillor Buds, please. Thank you. Uh, just a couple items for committee as well as council's consideration is our second and third reading of the bylaw we just passed in council. And then we have the city manager's department as well as corporate services department's report for the first quarter. And so a fairly um, articulated report in those uh, two areas. And uh, I know uh, myself or administration welcome any questions that might come out of those review of those reports. Any questions? Okay, hearing none, that concludes uh, my report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Buds. City Planning and Economic Development Committee. Councillor Dreger, please. For consideration at our next council meeting will be a, uh, an application that was submitted by the City of Portage of Prairie for the subdivision of three lots from the present holding. And this is a section of land that has received a fair bit of attention of late. Uh, lots two, one and two of this um, section of land will each contain a four-story apartment building in addition to single-level townhouses. A three-story assisted living facility is proposed for lot three and all the lots will be serviced by municipal sewer and piped water. Access to the proposed and, res and residual lots will be from a proposed public, public road. Uh, the development plan uh, outlines some policies there that need to be followed when looking at this um, application. There's been comments made by L Bell MTS, also the Historic Resources, Manitoba Hydro, Port Prairie Planning District, Shaw Cable, and uh, is that Winnipeg Land Titles Office? Is that what WLTO stands for? I couldn't quite determine. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, they've each made some comments towards this recommendation. So I'm anticipating some um, discussion and uh, moving forward with it. Is there any questions on that item? We also have the uh, building reports from the planning districts for March and has as has been um, the trend in the last year or so, we, we're continuing to see an increase in uh, building permits being purchased in light of all the activity that is going on in Portage these days. And the third item there is the first quarter uh, report from PRED. And as you will notice, Vern is not in around the table today. He is in uh, the Netherlands, actually at a conference. Uh, representing Portage de Prairie, Manitoba, and Canada as a whole. And uh, I'm sure he'll have quite a report coming back to us from, from that experience. There is uh, a lot of good stuff happening in the Pred office these days, and um, you're invited to read the report as presented. Any questions? Any comments? Councillor Draycott. Thank you, Your Worship. One thing uh, from our last PRED meeting that I was really excited to hear is that the investment announcements this year have actually out-totaled last year's total investment announcements. So kind of surprising in our first quarter that we would be sitting in this position, but a nice position to be in. Very nice position to be in, yes. Just also sitting on that board, I think it's worth noting that I know um, um, Vern is uh, in travels, but he's uh, in good company. And in fact, I think um, the effort put forth in marketing our region is paying dividends, as we know, um, as well. I think the company that he's keeping on this uh, tour uh, are the likes of the uh, city of Winnipeg. I think uh, Vancouver and Toronto, I believe, are also there. So there's absolutely no cities of our size represented uh, in our country at this uh, event that we were asked to, uh, to attend. And I think it just bodes so well for what we've been able to do here uh, regionally and um, hope that he comes back with... Uh, Lots of uh, contacts uh, for the city. Any other questions for Councillor Dreger? Okay, thank that you. Concludes my report for this evening. Community Services Committee, Councillor Frase, please. Thank you, Worship. Community Services Committee has uh, first quarter reports from a list of 
uh, agencies, organizations, uh, subcommittees, and some of the city's own departments, like the Parks Department, all outlining good work they've been doing in the first quarter, preparing for the upcoming summer, and keeping our city in generally good shape for its citizens. So those are open for anyone to have a look at and ask any questions. And that concludes okay. my report. Thank you, Councilor Fries. Waterworks Committee, Councilor Wall. Yes, Your Worship, the first quarter reports for the water treatment plant, the water pollution control facility, and the waterworks uh, group are all available for your perusal. And uh, that's all I have this evening. Thank you, Councilor Wall. Council Draycott, Transportation. Thank you, Your Worship. This evening we do have first quarterly reports for both our engineering department and our transportation department. Uh, just something to take away is that we are undergoing five-year strategic plans for all our water, our wastewater, and our overlay programs. So uh, that's exciting for our engineering division so that they can keep on top of things that need to be done in the next five years and make sure that priorities are laid out properly. So other than that, just regular uh, first quarter type activities taking place by both those departments getting our city ready for spring. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Councillor Draycott. And uh, Councillor Fraze for Councillor Espy, Public Safety Committee. Thank you, Worship. Three items. Uh, the first one is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the next uh, council meeting we'll be looking at second and third reading of the emergency preparedness bylaw that we looked at earlier today. Uh, the second item is an emergency plan, which is just a slightly different focus on emergency preparedness. Uh, the emergency plan, which will be made public and is available as a document on this uh, report, looks at the way the school division and the city cooperate in emergency preparedness, the school division providing transportation in that event, and the coordination of that. Uh, action so that'll come up uh, for next council and the third item is first quarter reports for the public safety operations the fire department RCMP and bylaw enforcement all of which show pretty steady as we go slight increase in some areas decrease in others still too many cats mayor Ferris I, I've heard that yes anybody needs a cat And that concludes that public. concludes your report. Thank you, Councillor Fraze. So before we adjourn committee, we're going to move into question period. Uh, question period for those that haven't been here uh, lasts a total of 15 minutes. Uh, that 15 minutes can be uh, extended with a majority vote from council. Um, and um, we're open to information seeking questions and we'll endeavor to uh, get you the information that you request. Mr. Knott, would you have a question this evening? Mayor Ferris, <clears throat> my first question <clears throat> is, would council be prepared to extend question period now? Absolutely not. Next question. Earlier on this evening, a question was asked about before a public hearing, if anyone was asked ready to speak to a public hearing and there wasn't any. Uh, there was a comment from the back of the hall, we know it's already approved. How was approval made known to people before the vote was taken? Sorry, I, I don't know. I didn't hear the comment. The comment was that what was approved? Whatever the public hearing was involved in. Oh, the financial plan? No, Your Worship, I think uh, he's referring to Mr. Nickart's comment that uh, his variance had already been approved, but it had expired. And it had expired, approved. yes. That was my understanding as well. Yeah. If you Are you asking about the one for Mr. Nickart, Mr. Nod? No, 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 the question stands. If you're asking about Mr. Nickart's question, his... his uh, his variation expired, it's good for a year, and as long as you come in and, and reapply for it before it expires, you can you can ask for a year's extension as long as the applicant does that. Uh, his his uh, his application expired uh, by a week, so he had to come in and reapply for it, and that's what he did tonight. Taking my turn, I've got Further questions? Uh, Mr. Beers? 
Mayor, Councils, Managers, uh, thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I think you all know my feelings on the uh, incentives uh, provided for the uh, new developers. Um, I had emailed everyone uh, th later this afternoon. I had just found out about this uh, today at noon. I'm not sure what the um, procedures are, but I think it wasn't very much time given to, uh, to comment on this. Um, you know what, we, we give incentives to developers coming in. Uh, we have uh, local developers who have uh, you know, put a lot of dollars into this uh, community over the years. We had a slow growth community over the years. So I think that you can uh, um, understand uh, why that uh, solid investment can't be made without some thought process um, going into the future. I mean, we do have Roquette, we have Simplot, we have all of these things coming. And yes, now we're opening the doors to bigger, larger investment corporations coming into the city and letting them have incentives. Do you not think that that company would in, uh, invest in that land without the incentive? If they don't see the value in that land, you know, without these incentives, do you think they would still be here? They'd be here anyways. So we are, yes, we realize zero tax gains right now today, but they will be there anyways. Let them make those investments in our community based on are we investable? You're just saying, yeah, we're investable, but we're, we're willing to give you tax breaks. I myself have invested, we have other developers here in Portage and people that own rentals. Are we prepared to give all of us those same tax breaks, incentives to carry on our businesses. Well, I can answer you, I can answer for my part to Mr. Beers. If you or any of those other developers in Portage of Prairie came to us with a similar proposal, we would be absolutely open to it. If it was for rentals, absolutely open to well, it. Why, why would it be just for rentals? <laughs> be, well, the reason for that is rentals, right now, two bedroom, the vacancy rate in Portage is 1.5%. I'm told the vacancy rate for three bedrooms is 0%. There's nothing to rent out there, I'm told. Yeah, no, it is, it is that way. I realize that. But in the background, there's a lot of other people looking at doing investments and, and uh, perhaps haven't had the complete time to put their foot forward for this. Um, so you can see where there's going to be investments go backwards because of this announcement too, not forwards. We are, we are not all great big companies like the one that's proposed and thank you for them coming to Portage. I'm not against investment. Let them do their thing, let them invest in Portage. Hey, it's based on a business decision, but it should not be the council's decision to give the tax dollars away that are coming from that. We've achieved zero uh, budget, um, I think we've kept our mill rate in line. We've done a good job with that, but you're giving away our future by giving away these tax dollars. That would be there regardless. If you phone that company tomorrow and say, are you investing tomorrow or not based on this decision, I think you would uh, find out that they would do it regardless. So we've basically given away a lot of tax dollars, not just from ourselves, from all citizens, all businesses. What happens when we got a dealership that comes in and wants to set up beside Craig Dunn and wants the incentives? So they want to grow, they want to have a dealership. So now are they in allowed incentives? We've set the precedent. So if we have a trucking company come in, if we have another bank come in and they want to build a building in town, well, yeah, it's a needed business. We have growth going. So are we going to give them incentives to invest in our town? We've just opened the door to all of that. And I think that's wrong. We have people that have committed to this community over the years invested their time, their money, their perseverance to stay with a city that hasn't grown. And now we've just been said, oh, there's somebody bigger. You guys are out. Yeah, you'll do that incentive to us. I don't come to you and ask for an incentive. I feel if I'm going to invest in this city, I'm going to do it because I feel I want to put my money in the city and invest. I don't come for those incentives. Obviously, I should have because the door is open for that. And that you've opened the door for a lot of other people to come which I think is wrong. That cuts down on our tax base. We only have taxes as our assets to work from, and you're not, we're not receiving them because of this. That's my comments on it. This will change new investment thinking, yeah? Some of these big companies can come in and do it, but for our smaller, medium invest, uh, investment uh, people in Portage, that's gonna hurt us. Those are my comments. Obviously, the decision has been made, but Oh, well, first reading has been done. Mr. Beers is okay. going to be second and third reading, so this is not done. Okay. Uh, next council meeting will be second and third um, okay. reading, so it's um, it's not done. I think yeah. you know so, uh, yeah. council's positions on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to state my position. I think I made it clear with my email, but uh, thank you. Thank you.
evening. Your name for the record, sir? Uh, for the record, my name is J.P. Commodore. Again, I echo what Chris Beer said this evening, but I have questions for you. The first one is this one. I've heard the comment or the, the words, uh, great growth in Portia Prairie. It's been great. It's going good. My question to Council tonight is that why are we providing incentives in the time where we have growth? An incentive program is usually there when there okay. is no growth. Okay, so do you want an answer to your question, sir? Yes, that's okay. my question. Well, there's a specific need in Portage of Prairie right now for rental units. We've heard that from numerous people. And so this is to address a need and accommodate that growth. We're gonna have a large number of tradespeople coming to Portage over the next two years to do construction. And uh, they need a place to stay. There's also people that currently live here that are looking for rentals. So that's a part of it. Understand, I, I always understand there's a need for housing. Sir, do you have another question? Yes, I do. Okay. When you do the math, um, it's, it shows that you have about 107, or 176 new units in that project. And if I take an average of $250,000 to build one door, the project's going to spend $44 million to build this actual process or this uh, subdivision. And if I do my math, the city's going to save $568,000 in taxes. When I reverse it, that's 1.29% of the capital project. So if they're coming in here building this many units and we get excited, we know they're going to, buy, by, by the numbers, they're going to spend $44 million. And they're asking the city, can you please give me a rebate of 568000 That's 1.29% of the project. If I was building that project, I wouldn't come begging for 1.2% rebate on a $44 million. It's going to be built. The number's there. Sir, what, what's your question, sir? My question is, why is the city council approving or, or entertaining approving a rebate of 1.29% for a $44 million project. It's such a small number. So you, that's your question, is yes. why are we approving it? Yes. Okay, thank you for the question. I think the question's have been answered uh, numerous times here. It's to accommodate growth, to encourage rental, the construction of rental. So that question has been answered several times here this evening. Next question. Next question. On their proposal, they have very aggressive timelines that they're going to build a 32 unit apartment building in three months, six months. That's awesome. What are we going to do? What is the city council going to do if they don't meet the timelines? Um, well, there's a number of things going to be built into the contract. Um, oh, I guess my question what is that? Yeah. Um, would you like to speak to that a little bit, Mr. Pato? Uh, through your worship to the presenter, the key to this project is there's a very short time window in which they can build and receive the incentive. So if they don't build the project within that time period, they don't get the incentive. That's more than fair. So you're, what C Council is saying today, that you're going to approve that type of a rebate over five years, but if you don't meet those guidelines without asking for extensions, that's null and void. I could speak to the motion that was read today. It hasn't yes. been carried, of course. Yes. But it's set out, it has a clear deadline. If you don't reach that timetable, then you no longer get those incentives. So there's a very clear date in the actual motion, and there's also a clear step process in it. That's very fair. Okay. My last question. Were there other people that had questions? Just, you can stay up, but there's yep. nobody else. Um, Mr. Knott, you had a question? Sure. Okay, Mr. Knott, and then we'll get back to... Several of us have several questions. Okay, well, there's about two minutes left. Are there other people that haven't had a chance to ask questions yet? I have one last question. Is there anybody out there that hasn't, that wants to ask a question, haven't had a chance yet? There's a gentleman over here. Ms. Anderson, do you live in Portage La Prairie? I don't live in Portage La Prairie. Do you own property here? Yes. Do you? Okay, so you're a taxpayer? Yes. Okay, come on up. As a preface, uh, you've referred into the past that I don't live in Portage and have questioned my ability to, to raise questions. Well, you know, tonight so. we have a lot of citizens would like to ask questions. So. That's correct. Yeah. So my question is in regards to under the Municipal Act, Section 160, Council must hear any person who wishes to make a presentation, ask questions, or res uh, register an objection at a public hearing. Why have you refused to allow questions at the public hearing tonight? 
And people could do presentations at the public hearing. We weren't taking questions at the public hearing. So you, your decision was counter to the regulations in the Municipal Act, no, and that I was a conscious choice? Uh, it was a conscious choice. I don't, I believe we follow the Municipal Act. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There was another question. Uh, Mr. Oshis, come on up. I'll make this, I'll make this short. I explained earlier about the, the process of the, um, the, ten, the Greens tender. Um, the original tender was, a, uh, was not awarded. I got a letter from uh, Kelly Braden saying that this time the tender for the green space has been cancelled and will not be awarded. The highest ranked tender exceeded the city's budget amount for this work. It's the city's intent to reissue the tender, which it was. I, it was reissued, retendered. I, I put the same numbers in, which would still be 80,000 lower, the one that was awarded. And the one that was awarded, contrary to this uh, original tender, was uh, over budget. Could the council please explain why it was issued to a higher, or um, the tender that was over budget when in fact it was not issued the first time? Sure. Uh, now my understanding is, Mr. Oshis, that you've requested all that information from administration and they're putting together a package for you and to meet with you? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping so, yes. You made the request? Okay. I made a request, yep. Uh, they've told me that they're working on it for you. Okay. Yeah, so you'll be getting that soon. Uh, my last question would be, uh, will there be full transparency of the process of that tender? I'm not sure how you define full transparency. Anything that would fall under FIPA. I don't, I don't need to know who else and the details of the other tenders, but the, pro, the process and the scoring. Absolutely, the process and the scoring, yep. That will be, yep. Okay. Will council consider moving a motion to extend question period, please? Would anybody like to make that motion on council? I'll make that motion. Councillor Wall? Second. Okay. And Councillor Wall, how long are you extending it for? 15, 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Moved by Councillor Wall, seconded by Councillor Fraze to extend question period by 15 minutes. All those in favor? Okay, that's carried. Are there further questions? We've got 15 more minutes. Mr. Maxwell? I understand tax incentives given to new businesses, employing people, because your city grows with the employees. But I do not understand giving tax breaks to private companies to build rental property. Interest rates 3%, rents are $1,000 to $1,200 a month, Costs $175, 175000 a door to build a block. It's a nice return on your investment. Why are we being so generous? The only income a city has is taxes. You know where else to get money to pay your bills. It has to be from taxes. If you keep giving the taxes away, you're not going to pay your bills. When I sit here and listen to you tell me that there's no vacant, there's no apartment blocks in Portage, it has to happen. You're talking to the guy that has stood at the same desk more times than enough wanting to rezone a piece of property to build an apartment block on. And the biggest joke the city will ever have is the Lions Cup pool site. Could have been a beautiful condo. But you weren't on council, so you can't blame you. If you give this tax break to these people, you're still responsible to move the snow, haul the garbage, any problems. The fireman's going to want at least one and a half more employees. The policeman's going to want another policeman. How are you going to pay them? You're going to increase my taxes so that you can give this guy a break over here? Not fair, people. You didn't, to give incentives to people to build something they're making money on is not fair. A person comes here and wants to build a business, start a new company, and you give them a tax incentive because you're going to hire 20 employees. I understand that. But I do not understand giving to a rental. I, I know that I look around the council, I see the dirty looks I'm getting. I know that everybody's got their minds made up, but you know what? You'll regret it one day because you're given something that's not necessary. The only piece of block zoned in Port of Prairie to build apartment blocks on is the one you're talking about, the surfaced. The council made a decision to sell the piece of land to two people. 
didn't make a decision to sell, here's a piece of build, build an apartment block on. You don't know how many people would have stepped forward and built an apartment block. But no, two people got it. One party decided not to do anything with it. They're sitting. Now they want to use it, and they want you to give the tax break. Not right. Long ways from being right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. Um, my name is Eric Lee, for who doesn't know me here. Were any landlords contacted <coughs> about the vacancy rate? Did you ask the opinion of any existing landlords about that vacancy rate that, that CMHC publishes? Uh, no, I didn't, but okay. I talked to a lot of landlords about their vacancy rates. Then that's good, because you need to, you need to ask us, because there's, there's some data that's being used to formulate decisions that's not necessarily accurate. So feel free to Have ask. you got some vacancies, Mr. Lee? I have no vacancies, but I don't have two and three bedroom apartments. Okay. And what you're proposing to build is not low income housing. Those people coming in, they'll pay whatever, whatever. And those people that are building those buildings, they're gonna charge whatever. So you're giving a developer a huge just shove forward which I'm not against that, but I don't think it's necessary in this position to do that. Just my thoughts. Okay, thank you. My last uh, question slash comment, I, I lived in Cornwall for close to 10 years, and we went through a very <laughs> similar type of approach where a developer come in, and we, we saw it uh, happen, and I wanna make sure you guys are aware of what's gonna happen in five years. Those type of developers come in, they ask for a rebate, we give them the handout, which I don't believe should be done in this scenario, and after five years, when his tax rate is supposed to be based on the mill rate, that developer will come in and say, <coughs> my building's not worth 44 million, it's only worth 36 million, and he'll ask for his tax rate to go down based on the assessment. They'll come at you in a different direction. I believe they're coming now. Why? Because we need housing. The developer is not going down in Eli. He's come to Portia Prairie because there's a need, because he's gonna make money. <laughs> we, as City Portland Prairie taxpayers, should not be giving that type of rebate. So my question is, is council ready of what's going to happen in five years when you gave somebody a rebate, he's going to come back at you a second time. What is City Council going to do then in five years to protect for that, sir? Well, in Manitoba, the assessment is done by the province. And the taxes, of course, are based upon the assessed value of the profit. So we don't determine that. The building owner don't, doesn't determine that. So that'll be determined by the province. And we do understand that people are in the business to make money. That's not a shock or surprise to us, but we do appreciate your warning. Thank you. <coughs> Further questions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The federal government is in the middle of international trade discussions right now, free trade. The provinces are having a particularly egregious example of what free trade isn't or shouldn't be between provinces, especially in the West here. Uh, personally, I've stopped drinking BC wines, but there you go. Um, and the problem with the lack of free trade between provinces and the lack of um, <clears throat> competition between, <coughs> excuse me, municipalities, I'm coming off flu, um, is that it doesn't do anything in terms of prices for, for uh, people. Uh, there might be some people who benefit or not. So that's my preamble. The question is, with the upcoming large tenders that will be going out to make um, structural changes in the city, specifically the bridge, um, $4 million to play with. Last year, late last year, council changed its long time plan of accepting the lowest bid and decided after consultation in April when you asked uh, municipality or administration to check things out, later in the year council decided that no longer would you accept just the lowest bid and a tender. 
I can anticipate a lot of bids coming in for the next little while. Will you reconsider that policy and return to the policy of accepting the lowest bid? It's a complicated question, but it's a good one. Uh, currently, our procurement policy is under review, and if people remember back to, you can help me with the dates, Councillor Buds, or uh, probably last fall, there was uh, September, I think, um, uh, this council said that we'd like to look at more than just the price. Uh, there was a number of issues raised by the Chamber of Commerce and by the business community and by citizens. Um, and uh, they were saying there should be more than just the price. Uh, things like uh, people's contribution to the community, et cetera, et cetera, should be considered in there. So doing procurement based simply upon price is a very simple task. It's very easy for the staff to do, and it's very straightforward. The lowest price determines everything. New procurement policy is a lot more involved and a lot more detailed, a lot more complex as we're finding out as we move forward. Um, so anyway, um, it's a long wandering answer, meandering answer, Mr. Knott, but uh, currently our policy is under um, review, and I don't know if we'll change and go back to just the price. You say it's under review. It mean it did not change last year? It did change, and the procedures are under review right now. The problem with the under review, with this policy, which I understand now is under review again, is that you'll get a local bid or a bid that knows something about it. No one else will come in and bid because they know if they come in within 10,000 or 100,000 of the, uh, the asking price, they know they're not going to get the job. So you're not going to get bidders from Winnipeg, from Saskatoon, from anywhere else on major jobs in this town. You're guaranteeing that Moon and Messiton and any other construction companies that might be around will get the work. Well, that's all very well. It keeps the money in the community but you're opening yourself to all kinds of corruption and all kinds of fiscal duggery and all kinds of under-the-counter things. So my question is, would you again reconsider this policy which you are in the middle of initiating but is less than a year old? Okay, just to clarify, we do not currently and we will not have a buy local policy. That would be number one illegal under the trade agreements Manitoba has signed on to. So, uh, currently, all I can say is our, our procurement policy and the procedures are under review, and that's about all I can say about that tonight. And we are at the end of the 15 minutes. Mr. Maxwell? Just a simple one for you. Does this council have the right to give away the school taxes? Uh, I don't think we do. I'm sure I understand the question. Do, do we have the right to give away well, the school you're taxes? Giving, you're reducing taxes on this on these park blocks coming. Still pay the school. Part of the tax you're giving away belongs to the school board. Oh no, they'll still pay the school tax. They'll have to pay yeah. the whole school tax. Yeah. So you're only giving away city for spray taxes. Correct. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Okay, Chris. Mr. Beers? Give one more question, please. <laughs> Just a question that uh, uh, based on us looking at an incentive program for uh, Vianel for this uh, development. Uh, will there be any uh, questions to them about their local purchasing policies or you know their their purchases during construction? Uh, they are a well-established, very strong company. Uh, they have their own lumber yard, their own cement yard, their own labor. So I have nothing against that. If they come in to develop land, that's great. But if they are going to be getting an incentive from the citizens of Portage and the businesses of Portage, should that then also be a consideration? In, in that uh, incentive? Uh, it's not a consideration and it actually isn't in the contract that got first reading tonight uh, and I don't think it will be, uh, Mr. Beers. Okay, so then well, my question is, so we're giving away our business dollars with absolutely no question on them of their spending habits in our community. Well, nobody's got these dollars yet uh, because nothing's been developed on that land. Uh, this is new tax revenue we're talking about. It's nobody else's. Uh, it doesn't exist right now and it won't exist unless it's built and developed. So I, I guess it's a different way of looking at it. But we're rolling the dice and saying if we don't give the tax incentive, this, this uh, project will not go. I've talked to Roquette also and we had some plans 
on the move with them as far as temporary housing. Um, if this is why we're building the incentive into this program only for Roquette, well, that's a two-year program for those big renters that they need right now. What happens when they go away? Mm, this is not only for Roquette. I, I, I know uh, the, the lady that called me this afternoon, she's not a tradesperson. She's lived here for a long time. Uh, Roquette, Simplot, some other construction that's going to happen will make up some of that. Okay, and this was a question. <laughs> that same lady that called you called me and when asked why she had to be out by tomorrow and was going to be homeless, she owes her landlord $2,000 and so that's why she was being evicted. So in all fairness, if you have to be out within 24 hours, this is probably another story. Okay, it is a small city. Uh, I didn't know that. Okay, and uh, committee is adjourned at 8... 06 p.m. Thank you for coming out, everybody. I think this is actually so good. I've said that before, but I'm pretty sure now that it's not.